Welcome back, everybody. I'm Mark Fernandez, and you're listening to the Club Metaverse podcast. And today I am joined by the one and the only Anthony Scaramucci of Skybridge Capital. Anthony, sir, how are you today? I'm good, but I'm like jealous of your whole ab situation there. I mean, how do you stay in such good shape, Mark? Yeah, you know, basically, this is not what I used to look like. This is what I looked like after I aped in for about 40 ether. Um, and got this guy and then, you know, tried to figure out how do I actually make this an interoperable asset that I can leverage in multiple different spaces. And that's, you know, like I've been doing podcasts for a long time and I'm like, you know what, let me start creating like actual, you know, interoperable value out of this. All right. I mean, listen, thing I mean that I you know, so you're, but you, you know, you definitionely, you're not a bored ape because you look pretty excited to be <laughs> right. alive. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. What so are you? I have you as an excited ape, which is definitely different from a bored ape. But, I'm but, transitioning into being an excited ape. I was once a bored ape, and now I'm, um, you know, my whole thing is changing. All right. Well, you're looking good. Okay. Thank and I can, you. Even, I can even, you know, I have a smell of vision uh, computer, so I can smell the cigarette smoke coming in, <laughs> and it's it's feeling pretty good to me. Is that a is that a real window behind you? Or is that like an LCD screen? Like yeah. I, so no that no that's an LCD screen. So I'm sitting here okay. in my home office. That is the backdrop for the uh, CNBC studio hits. And, gotcha. Uh, so uh, you know, but it, if I do a hit at night, we obviously change the backdrop to make it look like it's nighttime in the city. Cool. So it's your own form of avatar. It's your kind of environmental avatar. It's an environmental avatar. I've been living in a two-dimensional world for two years. Uh, <laughs> and so I only meet people now two-dimensionally, unfortunately, but we're getting back out there now. I've been doing a little bit of traveling. That's awesome, Anthony. Um, Anthony, man, there's so much I'd love to sort of pick your brain about. Um, I, I love listening to you talk. Um, even today, I actually tweeted something that's a paraphrase of a quote that you had, because it's just a, such a powerful thought. And the thought was that um, you said this, and I'm you know, misquoting you a little bit, but the message was that in 1997, if you would have bought $10,000 worth of Amazon, uh, it'd be around $21, $22 million yeah. today. Yeah. But you would have had to have suffered through eight major price drops, including going as low as 87%. And, and you know, to me, that's that's the essence of what, you know, uh, the slang of diamond hands are forged, right? Like, like, yes. like you, you know, the idea that crypto is a long-term thing and to not look at it, um, to be patient and not be so short-sighted around it. Um, what, what, to reinforce that thought, you know, there's been so much volatility around the crypto markets in the last, I'd say two to three months, a lot of panicking and a lot of people saying, I told you so, I told you so. I bought my first Bitcoin in 20, uh, in 2013. Wow. Yeah, so so I've been around it since it was nine bucks. You know, I bought an empty Gox back in the old days, and to be honest with you, I sold all of mine uh, when when the price started dropping the first time, and I learned that very very difficult lesson. Um, when you're trying to bring people into crypto uh, today, especially the the level of seriousness that you deal with, how do you manage the concept of volatility with them? So I, I was looking at my phone because I was trying to find the cover. I have the cover of the Barons, but I can't find it. It's Jeff Bezos. I tweeted it. It says Amazon.bomb. I know, I know. I tweeted that because and, because I heard your quote and I found yeah. the cover. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, he, he, of course, has that cover in his office, you know, and uh, you want to talk about living large. He shot himself into outer space in his own penis rocket. I mean, that's like pretty cool. <laughs> And then he took Captain Kirk up there on another penis rocket. So <laughs> right, right, I mean, suborbital, yeah, suborbital. Yeah, yeah, you know it's hard not to love the guy. So yeah, but you know, lot, lot. Your let me, let me, let me address everything that you're talking about. So first sure. thing I would say, do you own any Bitcoin now, or you're out oh, of it? No, no, I'm, I'm completely in. I mean, yeah, okay. I dropped out after that first. It went up to like twelve hundred, then it dropped down. I, I got out at six, and then I got back in when it was like. 900 bucks or something so yeah yeah i'm i'm fully in i'm fully in. yeah so so you know i didn't get it i'm a late i'm a late bloomer then because my first coin purchase was at sixteen thousand. Oh uh, wow okay i'll say that was like probably november december of 2020 oh, so wow. i'm a i'm a Welcome. late bloomer i'm a later Welcome. adopter but it took me a while because i'm an institutionalist so so what i would say to people is in the three decades that I've been investing, 
there's been some seismic trends, some of which I've benefited from and some of which I've missed. Now, we probably, you and I and everyone listening has probably benefited from Amazon, mm -hmm. meaning more or less, you probably have an Amazon account. You probably bought something from Amazon. Maybe you're a member of Amazon Prime. Whether or not you were an investor of it or not, I don't know. I missed it because yeah, me too. if you listen to that podcast, you know, uh, Warren Buffett talked people out of it. He said, how could you buy Amazon? And it's worth more than the legendary storied retailer known as Sears Roebuck. And that's ridiculous. And so he's not going to make any money for 10 years. He just told you that. I'd rather be in things that are cash flowing and making money. And so I missed it because it was a exponential new trend. And I think cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in, in, in particular, <clears throat> I'm not missing that, Mark. I mean, there's no way I'm missing it because things are happening that are going to allow us to delayer the economy. You know, weirdly, Web3 may knock out Amazon. And let me just give you that example for a second because, yeah. you know, let's say I buy my deodorant from Amazon. Web3, the blockchain, I may be able to go directly to Procter & Gamble to buy my right guard, save the third-party intermediary of Amazon, MasterCard or Visa or American Express, which my credit card's linked to my Amazon account, and I'm saving the intermediaries of those two trusted third and fourth parties go direct to Procter and Gamble. Mm. They're willing to do that with me because I'm transferring value over the blockchain, right? So they don't have to know me, like me, or trust me, but they know they're getting the value over the blockchain. They hire themselves a relatively inexpensive fulfillment company and they ship me one stick of deodorant. Right. And you just took out those two big third parties that are making incremental profit, right? Mm. So to me, if I'm, you know, and Buffett, if you look, he sold his MasterCard and Visa and he bought this uh, company called New Bank, mm. which is a Brazilian company. Of course, it's loaded for bear in uh, Bitcoin. So anyway, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to, I don't know what to, to say or make of all of this stuff other than it's happening. It's upon us. Um, we need to be a part of it. We need to educate our clients with it. You know, I'm talking to a uh, shit talking monkey right now that's smoking a <laughs> cigarette. Right. And, you know, that's also happening. I would yeah. be embarrassed to tell you the number of hours my children spend in the metaverse. You'd probably call social services on me. Right. In terms of what they're doing. Whether it's Fortnite, Roblox, Halo, you 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 pick Facebook, you you pick whatever it is that they're doing, and so they're comfortable with it. And demographically, as mm -hmm. you and I age out of the system, this newer, younger generation of people, they're comfortable with cryptocurrency. They're comfortable with the blockchain. They're comfortable with the metaverse, and it's going to be a very big part of the future. So. Yeah. Got to get clients educated on it. We got to get them invested. First of all, that's 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 a really really uh, a positive thing for me to hear, and it gives me even more confidence in in all of my ambitions. I I came out in the Hollywood Reporter in 2017 as one of the first people to buy a LA based media company fully in Ethereum. Um, you know when when ooh, I bought Ethereum at very low, and and you know I've been very bullish about trying to mainstream the concept of crypto. Um, and, and it seems that, you know, that there's a resistance to it from the institutions, obviously, from the government, obviously. When we went, you know, in 2017, I was involved in an ICO and we raised an incredible amount of money in like 25 minutes. And then shortly thereafter, there was huge amount of regulations that popped up. Some of them, I think, good and necessary, you know, to protect, you know, people that, that you know, were getting hurt. Um, do you think that crypto is getting politicized? I've heard a lot of stuff recently about crypto is bad for the environment or they're trying to create kind of, you know, um, sort of anti-virtuous messages around using crypto. Do you think that this is 
something you know to to pay attention to? Do you agree that it's potentially bad for the environment? What what what's some of your take on that? Um, it's a really really good question, and so I can only surmise an answer. Obviously, I don't know the answer, um, but I think the weird thing about crypto is it should be supported by the progressives because it's offering the underbanked a banking opportunity where they can effectively be their own bank. They don't need to be subjected to the fees of the money center banks and mm. the minimum account uh, fee charges and the balances and all that other stuff. Uh, and the other thing I would say to you, which uh, I think is important is for whatever reason, these socialists, they think people are getting rich. Maybe Mark Fernandez is getting rich or Anthony Scaramucci is getting rich or crypto. They hate that. They obviously hate rich people. <laughs> so they're willing to cut the nose mm. off of a major economic change that actually benefits lower middle-class people because some people are going to get rich from it. And I think that's a really shame. I think it's really stupid. So one of the things they cling to is this whole carbon situation mm -hmm. and they they say well it's bad for the environment but let's just stop for a second and look at it empirically you know bitcoin is a 0.13 percent of the world's carbon emissions in terms of the energy because remember 56 percent of the mining comes from carbon-based energy so mm -hmm. when you felt form factor it it's 0.13 percent moreover Let's talk about something that is unbelievably energy intensive. And I have props with me, Mark. So let me show them to you. Oh, this is awesome. See, see these are uh, <laughs> these are Italian singles. You see those? Those are Italian oh, yeah, singles, yeah. right? Oh, I remember and those so, from Mott Street. Right, yeah. So these are super carbon emitting. Number one, you got to make them. Number two, sure. you got to drive over to the bank in your carbon emitting car and do the transaction. And the teller went over to the bank and her carbon or his carbon emitting car. And then you have the heat in the winter and the air conditioning in the summer. And if we don't have this and we have this, mm. we can really reduce carbon emission around the world. So sure, when they make these arguments, I don't even know where they're coming from. And then it ultimately comes down to, well, you know, we hate rich people and we hate successful people. And so we want to bark about this and see if we can overly regulate it and slow it down because it may make some people rich. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, even recently I've heard that there's been some talk about executive orders to regulate crypto and, and um, you know, there's been some, some other talk about um, you know, this, that, that, that one scandal that just popped um with the with the hack where the government seized billions of dollars you know worth of you know of bitcoin and all that stuff in any case i think we'll you know we'll we'll keep bouncing through it because ultimately you know you got to bring down the entire network or else it's just you know it's always going to work you know and that's the beautiful thing about a decentralized system like bitcoin um you know that it's it's very resistant to any kind of censorship except the lack of electricity. And, you know, there's there's something very hopeful to me about that. Um, to, to kind of switch over a little bit, you mentioned that your kids are, are involved in playing inside the metaverse and stuff like that. Um, do you see that there's going to be a potential HTTP type analog for a metaverse protocol that's actually open because currently like all these projects that you mentioned roblox call of duty halo etc they're highly centralized it, it, it's you know owned by a corporation has zero interoperability um they're closed systems do do you see a kind of a more wide open protocol for quote unquote metaverse yes i mean it's a great it's a great question and so the incentives are there to do that and so that's the next iteration of this. And so if you're at a centralized company, a centralized gaming company, a walled garden like Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, and you now have these technical properties known as the blockchain where we could set up a decentralized social media organism or a decentralized game and the game could be controlled by the users 
and perhaps there's tokenized incentives yep. that are coming through the users and the users are making a commitment to each other to support the game and to look at what Bitcoin does with the Bitcoin network. There's 150 or so, so thousand nodes, all of which are incentivized by the network. Yep. All of a sudden, you're taking out that central figure, that central corporation. So I don't see how that doesn't happen because the incentives are there to make it happen. So, so to me, um, and somebody asked me a great question. I was given a presentation in Boston last night and man, I wish I had more time to think about the answer because they asked me a question about what is going to happen in the blockchain. Like who's going to get knocked out, right? Who's the blockbuster that gets big footed by Netflix knocked to the ground. And I was thinking of third parties in the sense of a credit card company, an intermediation that we just discussed with Amazon and sure. Procter and Gamble. But to really get metaphysical, how about everybody? Because right. ultimately, you're going to be in a situation where corporations and DAOs are going to get set up and they're going to be mutually incentivized to handle themselves in certain ways, whether it's buying a constitution, creating a game, uh, setting up a social media platform. Yeah. Uh, that will have some dolphins. Yes, exactly. And so, and so right. why wouldn't that happen? And, and so I see that. And then that's another very big, to me, at least, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm obviously uh, new to this world, uh, but I'm getting up to speed very quickly. But yeah. I would say to you, to me, this is like, how could I not own Ethereum and Bitcoin and some of these uh, metaverse coins and Solana, uh, Polkadot? How could I not be uh, Algorand? How could I not be part of them? Because if what I think is going to happen only happens 10% to the scale and size of what I think is going to happen, you know, you and I are sitting you know, we're in the wild west and we're, we're on the frontier. And when the rest of the troops get to us, we'll have already bought all the waterfront property. Yeah. You, you also had this other quote from your podcast where, where you mentioned that even if you only put one cent out of a dollar, it'll still be your highest performing asset. If you had invested that in Bitcoin. Yes. Well, that was the case for 10 years. And so if you yeah. went from 2009 to 2019, you had one penny in Bitcoin and you had 99 cents in cash. You outperformed every measurable portfolio index. So you outperformed a stock and bond index, a portfolio allocation of private equity, venture. Uh, you outperformed everything. And by the way, you did it with incredibly less risk because, again, 99% of your money was in cash. Yeah. And it, and it, it speaks to the adoption cycle. Now I'm not saying the returns will be as good over the next 10 years, but it is pretty clear to me that Bitcoin will be worth a million dollars a coin. I would say I'm very confident that it'll go 10 to one over five years mm. um, because you just have a shortage of supply and you have heavy demand. And I'll tell you, you want to talk about a floodgate. How about getting a Bitcoin cash ETF approved in the United States, that floodgate will open. Right. And you, 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 you think about it from a game theory perspective. Let's say I was at Wells Fargo. Um, I'd be like, oh my God, my competitors at Bank America or my competitors at Chase are going to be offering a Bitcoin cash ETF to their customers. I therefore have to offer a Bitcoin ETF. So think of that game theory it sort of forces everybody, flushes everybody into the system, you see? And so, and then, you know, and you have this shortage. You don't have the, uh, you don't have the supply. Bitcoin is one of the most unique stores of value because there's still 35% of the available gold globally that's in the ground somewhere on planet Earth. Right. You know, or a meteor hit the Earth. We haven't found that meteor yet. And we only have 65% of the available gold mined that we've accounted for. So, you know, Bitcoin, you got 21 million coins. That's it. 
Uh, we're leaking out some coins now towards the end between now and 2140. You've got most of it has been mined. Some of it has been lost. Think about that. Right. You no, know, you and I both know somebody poor some poor SOB has a laptop that they bought some bitcoins on as a joke, threw the laptop out. Oh man. You know, that that even... one guy, right? He said, I think I got fifty to eighty million dollars of Bitcoin on my laptop. Could could you come with me and dig it out? I'll split it with you. And the town said no. But but the point I'm making is we may not see those returns going forward, but you could see 10 or 20 to one returns. And since we mentioned Amazon, let's go back to Amazon. If you bought Amazon after the global financial crisis in mm. 2009, you're 64 to one on Amazon. Wow. So a $1 million investment, 2009, now worth 64 million US dollars. Now that's not as big as a ten thousand going to twenty two million, sure. But it is big, and so and that's twelve years after Amazon's IPO, nineteen ninety seven to two thousand nine. We're in Bitcoin's thirteenth year. It is hard for me to believe that there's a bigger or better opportunity out there, and I'm going to make an argument that some people, and perhaps the people on your podcast, are advanced. And they're thinking about this stuff, but a lot of the fuddy duddies that I talk to in traditional finance would laugh at me, but I'm going to say it anyway. I actually think Bitcoin is a lower risk way mm. to get to those returns because it is the apex predator in the space of cryptocurrency and its wallet expansion is growing exponentially. Now, to that to that point, do you try to temper the expectation around the timeline to a new investor. Yes. Uh, so what is that time frame that that you give typically? Well, I say, you know, I say that it's um it's, you know, I feel like, you know, are you Catholic by the way, Fernandez? You sound you your last name's Fernandez. You're probably Catholic, right? I am Catholic. Yeah. I, so I, yeah. So I feel like I'm in the confession booth now with the priest. Okay. I have a monkey smoking a cigarette as a priest here. So I'm right. not like open. Up but I've spent a lot of time in Tel Aviv. So I, I'm kind of both. I'm kind okay. of both. All right. Well, you know, I'm going to make a confession to you. Okay. Yeah. I actually lowball all of my conversations with my clients. Number one, I'm a regulated entity. Number two, it's I'm an SEC registered investment advisor. Of course. And so I never really tell people what I honestly think. Okay. And so I'm making a confession. So I, if you were my client, I'd say, okay, listen, have a one to 5% position in Bitcoin. It'll probably be a half a million dollars a coin. Your 5% position will go to 25 or your 1% position will go to five. You'll be super happy with me. Right. And shut up. But I actually think these coins are going to be worth millions of dollars. Right. millions of dollars these coins and each. they'll be they'll be each and they'll be broken up into satoshis but i don't like talking like that because i don't want the client to think that i'm coming at them with a plastic flower in my lapel and i'm shooting water at them you know <laughs> like i'm some kind of huckster <laughs> bullshit artist you know i don't right. want to talk like that because it sounds incredulous but let me step back for you for a second mm. Let's go back to when Facebook had 240 million members or people that had logged in had Facebook accounts. Right. And what have I said to you? And we were doing a podcast and that was got probably 13 or 14 years ago. I said, hey, Mark, this thing known as Facebook started with three people in a room. They did the Harvard classes and then they moved out to some of the other classes. And it now has 240 million people. But someday in 2022, which will come very quickly, it'll have 3 billion people. What will happen to Facebook stock over that period of time? Right. Of course, it went up 26 to 1. And here we are. And that happened. And so could Bitcoin have 3 billion people that will have Bitcoin wallets and using Bitcoin or layer one technologies like Algorand or Ethereum mm -hmm. on their smartphones, transacting with each other 
or transacting and buying goods and services over the metaverse. Uh, yeah. Yes. Right. And yeah. so why, why is it that Apple computer could go 41,000 to one and Microsoft and yet this new, this brand new technology, and you could say to me, well, it's not that new, it's 13 years old. But then I would say, okay, well, think about this. It got to a trillion dollars faster than any of those other technologies. How could it be that it couldn't happen here for that? And then maybe you'll say, well, regulation, or there'll be a better competitor, or there'll be a... Uh, digitization of the U S dollar, something like that. But then I'd be like, okay, well, still not going to knock it out of the game. It's still going to have requisite market share right. relative to others. And, and so think about this, as we talk about layer one cryptocurrencies like Algorand or Ethereum, it reminds me of the cloud discussion we had 15 years ago. So in the cloud discussion, culturally people said, no way, wait a minute, I'm going to take my secure data off of these servers in my office and I'm going to put them on some, I'm going to put them up in the cloud, which is a euphemism for saying they're going on someone else's server. <laughs> right. Okay. And, and why would I do that? And there were chief technology officers all over the world that said NFW not doing that. And then lo and behold, people got comfortable with it and they were like, well, wait a minute, this is going to save me millions of dollars. Um, you know, the same way, Skybridge outsources its payroll to, I think, paychecks. They do our payroll and our accounting on it. They send us our paychecks and they have it all mm -hmm. locked out and they send out the uh, W-2s and all that other stuff for the clients. I mean, sorry, for the employees. All of a sudden now the cloud is doing that, right? And think about it from electricity generation. We had the generator, JP Morgan had a, diesel fire generator outside his house in New York city on 36th street. And then obviously the evolution of con Edison, we centralized the generation of power and then we drew lines from the power source. And that was a way cheaper way of doing it. And obviously ecologically better, et cetera. Why is it that we don't see that here? Why do, why do we not see that evolution? Why can't Algorand and Bitcoin be like the cloud Amazon has the cloud. Microsoft has the cloud. Oracle has the cloud. They're each different genres and slivers of the cloud. See, I think Algorand will be the protocol that wins in the financial services community. It, oh. it looks like it looks like Ethereum has already won in the what I would call the artistic mm. development community. Solana is going to be a part of that as well. Polkadot. But if you talk to a senior CTO at a Cap Gemini or an AXA XL, and they're looking at all of these different protocols, they would say to you, well, Amazon is super fast. I'm sorry, Algorand is super fast, has negative net carbon. It's very secure. The system is never broken down. Like Bitcoin, the system doesn't break down because of the decentralized properties of it. Mm. Um, Solana has, as you know, gone down a few times, yeah. most recently in the last big market swoon, but not Algorand. And so a lot of these CTOs are like, yeah, we're going to run a lot of our stuff off of Algorand. So Algorand's trading 90 cents. Could it be a $10 situation in five or 10 years? I believe it could be. Well, look, first of all, I have a few confessions for you to keep it in the Catholic tradition. Yes. Number one, I've never heard of Algorand and okay. I'm a deep uh, crypto guy. So after this podcast is over, I'm probably going to go and buy some, you know, because if it's only 90 cents, I might ape into that pretty hard because it sounds very interesting from how you're describing it. Oh, well, take a look at it. And I'm, I'm in the process. I just have a, here. A, I have a, I wrote a book on Bitcoin last year mm. it's called The Sweet Life with Bitcoin. That's a birthday cake from my birthday last year that my wife made <laughs> and this is a book that that's uh, a real birthday cake she actually made you that yeah birthday? that's a real birthday it was actually made by her friend oh that's cool uh, and her friend has a company called candy c-a-n-d-i grams and you could so buy cool. a bitcoin birthday cake if you live out on long island she'll make one for you but but and their her cakes are great but i titled the book the sweet life with bitcoin like relax you know how i stopped worrying about the cryptocurrency about cryptocurrency and you should too. Mm. And I made it a very short book, Mark, because 
I wanted people to read the goddamn thing. If they opened it up, they would read it. Good. It's got information in it related to mining and what Bitcoin actually is. The white papers in here. Mm. And this is a draft of my Algorand book, which I've been working on for the last oh, wow. few months. Oh, cool. And so the Algorand book will be like this. And I'll send you a copy of it when it, when I'm done with it. Oh, I'd love that. But but Algorand, according to CoinGecko, I'll just look it up here. Say it's 24th or 25th on CoinGecko. It's trading at 99 cents as we're talking. It's got a 6.6 .6 billion dollar market capitalization. If the adoption takes place that I predict, which will be large scale corporate adoption. Mm. around Algorand and there'll be lots of tokenized projects that are being built on Algorand and Algorand is known for its decentralization, the security, the scalability, it's solving for the trilemma uh, and it's interoperable. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the leaders. And I, I would say about Algorand, you know, it's like uh, if you and I were logging on to the internet in 1990. Seven, we had America Online, we had Alta Vista, we had Lycos, we had Ask Jeeves, Yahoo, and then this, there was this small upstart company known as Google, and uh, they had a better mousetrap. It was uh, more efficient, it had machine learning in it, it was able to rank and tier the searches in a better way, and it ate everybody's lunch, you know? And I think that's going to happen. I think Algorand is, is literally the Google of uh, of layer one. Well, currency this, protocols. this is a first for the podcast, but um, I can't show it to you because I have this avatar rig going. But I just bought myself some Algorand. I okay, well, to, there you go. See that? I, I just went to Coinbase. You're, 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 you're smoking an imaginary <laughs> cigarette and you're and you're buying stuff. Yeah. And, and that is the future of our society. Okay, I'll I'll be... You yeah, know, yeah, wearing for, a skin someday in the metaverse while I'm probably eating a taco from Taco <laughs> Bell or some shit. Right. Like that, so know? for the record, I bought a little bit over 3,500 Algorand. Thank you very much for that tip. All right. Well, I, I would say and just be patient, hold on to it as that story unfolds. I think you're going to be very happy. That's awesome. So let, let me uh, tell you my second confession, because I think that this is a very important distinction for people to make that I learned the hard way. And in around 2016, 2017, I made a really stupid mistake and I bought a Porsche with Bitcoin. I took Bitcoin, I liquidated, it went to the place and I bought the Porsche outright, okay? That was in 2016, 2017. Bitcoin hadn't even crossed 10,000 bucks yet. You know, it was like at the 6, 7K mark. Um, that's obviously the most expensive Porsche that I've ever bought, you know, that anybody's bought like in the last like 10 years, you know, right, because like it's pizzas, like... Right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, 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 like the pizzas. So when people say crypto is a currency, it seems to me that experientially, I actually completely disagree with that. To me, crypto is more like a house or gold. It's a store of value that appreciates over time that you liquidate when you want to have a liquidation event, but that you don't really use it to like break it up into little pieces and make small transactions with. Do you try to inform of people that are getting into it to think of it that way? Or do you truly think that it is more of like a transactional thing where you should oh. feel comfortable with that? Well, I'm, I'm in your camp. What I would tell people, uh, I would take a, a step back even from your camp. I would say to people, listen, this is an early adopting technology. And this is uh, something that you need to own it's going to be very volatile. So definitionally can't call it a store of value. Mm. I think the way you're describing it is because you're a long-term Bitcoin holder. If you step back from the chart, it is moving in a certain direction, even though it has wiggles in it. And so therefore you're saying I can chip away at it when I need to buy something. But I would caution people about that because I would want them to think about it over a three to five year period of time. I would want them to just put money in there that they don't need to spend anything on for right now and let that germinate, let that grow over time. And then if we're sitting here five or 10 years from now, I would bet someone will be writing, well, Bitcoin is digital gold. You know, it's got a $15 trillion market gap and it's uh, this incredible 
remarkably useful transactional technology. And so will it ever be a quote unquote currency? And so the short answer to that is yes, because it already is in El Salvador. The yeah. longer answer is, will the mature developed countries, fully developed countries, the Western European countries, the United States, will it ever be accepted in the United States like that? And I don't know the answer to that. Probably not, but it won't matter because what you just said will be the de facto standard. It'll sit on your phone as a store of value. You'll own it as a chunk of value. You walk into the Starbucks, you'll chip some off. <laughs> and you'll convert it into a stable coin or whatever it is that Starbucks is accepting. Right. And you'll transfer it out of there and, and cash into your latte. So, so, but remember, you know, you have the lightning network for Bitcoin, you know, Jack Mahler's is working on that. Elizabeth Stark is working on that. You have a situation where through the lightning network, you could be in a situation where you could, transact and you could transact quickly and you could layer it or wrap it in Algorand or Ethereum and it'll move quickly and it'd be at lower costs. And so I don't know, but here's right. what I do know. And I want to, I want to, I want to remind people of this. I want to take you back. It's 1998. Oh, great. You year. and I are dialing into the internet. We have that dial up yeah. modem. You can hear Yank the purring. You can hear the purring and the buzzing mark. Yeah, Yankees and, went 120 games, I think, that year. Yeah, yeah, that was a great season for the Yanks, right? And they swept the San Diego Padres. That yep. was a great season. And you're dialing in. It's taking 35 seconds for your Amazon homepage to <laughs> land <laughs> on your computer. Right. And you're going to then buy a book from them. And it's 1998. And I come in as a swami with a crystal ball. And you obviously don't look like a smoking, bored, or excited ape. And I right. say, hey, Mark, let me tell you what's going to happen. You see how that machine is dialing in and it's taking 35 seconds for that landing page to happen? Well, in 15 short years, by 2013, 2012, even 2010, you'll be streaming on broadband, high definition, and eventually 4 and 8K video resolution of movies alongside of tens of, if not hundreds of millions right. of other people doing the exact same thing. I would believe you. I mean, obviously. Yeah, yeah. so it's very hard to understand, right? So that's what I'm saying. Imagine these networks and the proliferation of what's going to happen in these networks over the next 10 or 15 years. There's stuff going to happen. You and I, hopefully we'll know each other 15 years from now. God willing, I'll be alive. I yeah. say, Mark, can you believe that that happened? Or could you believe that, you know, that Decentraland piece of property that sold for $8 million in 2022 is $150 million today That's because of the scarcity? Yeah. Like, can you believe that Nike and McDonald's are advertising in Decentraland or there are billboards in Fortnite as the troops are going through the houses? You can see advertising. You know, for me, the biggest paradigm shift around all that stuff, I think, comes into play with this idea of you, you know, you used that word before, the DAO, the concept that there are truly community owned uh, entities, kind of like the Green Bay Packers or something, yes. which is, you know, mm -hmm. such an anomalous thing within the context of the NFL that truly um, big organizations are going to be owned en masse. I think that that's the one thing that if you walk into, you know, anybody's office, you know, like with that crystal ball, you show up in front of Big Zuck and you go, hey, Mark, you know, Meta, for you to actually win with Meta, you got to open it up and let everybody own it or, or, or something, to, you know, like along those lines. That sounds like truly crazy talk. But I think if the power value starts shifting over into these DAOs and into like, these people that control their own currencies that are accepted in DeFi protocols and are liquid and can exchange value, uh, you know, the, the concept of ownership, I think, is going to be the one that's going to be shifted the most, you know, like even in gaming, that's my thing. I'm a games guy. Um, and in the game that I'm making, Club Metaverse, 
The whole idea is that you own all of your assets and all of those assets you can trade on an open market freely, not like World of Warcraft when you used to do that back in the old days and you would get your account banned and there was like Chinese companies doing billions of dollars selling World of Warcraft gold as an illegal action, but that that's an encouraged action, you know, that like, you know, that a DAO could come up and buy the Miami Dolphins, you know, or that, that, that own the concept of ownership, I think is going to drastically change. Obviously I don't fully understand where it's going, but I do see that trajectory. All right. Well, we agree. And, and by the way, we, you know, through tokenization, we could have greater and greater concepts of shared ownership. Right. You know, as we do, you know, with net jets, you own a fractional share of a plane or you have a fractional share of a vacation home. You know, what, what I am fascinated by is the portion of our assets that is liquid is very small. It's cash, bo stocks, bonds, mm. you know, securities, mortgage-backed securities, things like that. But look at all the things that are not liquid or not co-owned right now that could effectively be co-owned by a large group of people. And if you didn't have the very competitive Ken Griffin, <laughs> who's a gajillionaire from Citadel, right. who outbid that Dow and bought the Constitution by $43 million, you know, you, you could have seen a situation where there was a fractional ownership of one of the original U.S. constitutions by a very large group of people. Yeah, that's wild. And that's happening as a result of the formation of these communities and the tokens surrounding these communities. So one thing that I'm, you know, I've, I've been dying to ask you this since I started really digging into your thought process. Um, you're, you're obviously extremely bullish on Bitcoin. You're seeing Bitcoin go up to potentially a million dollars a coin. Do you feel similarly bullish on Ethereum or do you think that Ethereum's got a ceiling? And if so, where is that ceiling at? Listen, I'm, I'm bullish on Ethereum. You know, I like Ethereum. I, I like Bitcoin because it's the apex predator. And as I said, and this will upset institutional people, Bitcoin is a lower risk play in the in that universe. Ethereum has a great community, is a great community of developers and programmers. They've done a great job of burning off some of it. They're figuring out a way to lower the gas fees associated mm -hmm. with Ethereum. And Ethereum, in my mind, has reached escape velocity. And so therefore it's in existence now and will be one of the winners. So I like Ethereum. And by the way, so much so that we have our own Ethereum only fund and I have a lot of money, my personal money in that fund. Mm -hmm. um, I like Algorand. You know, we have a $250 million fund related to Algorand. Yeah. I think I'm already I think that, in that. I'm already in that. <laughs> I think that's going to be one of the winners. Uh, I think Solana has the capability, but I think it needs some upgrading. But yeah. I think these guys are absolutely brilliant and they know what they're doing. And I think that that will also win, um, you know, again, Polkadot, Avalanche. So, you know, we have a Polycoin fund uh, that is trying to take advantage of those as well. So, yeah, I'm optimistic. I am not optimistic about 8,000 coins, however. I don't see the use case for a lot of these coins, some of these meme coins and things like that. Sure. I don't see it. Now, maybe I'll be proven wrong, and that's fine. I've been proven wrong a lot in my life. Uh, I'll embarrass myself here on your podcast. I had the opportunity to buy into something called Uber at a very, <laughs> very tiny valuation. Yeah, me too. And and the guy was explaining to me that some unknown person in an unknown car was going to pick up my daughter and drive her around New York City. And I was like, there's no way that's ever going to happen. I'm not, yeah. I'm not investing in this. And of course, I have more Uber charges on my American Express card, I think, than anything <laughs> yeah, other than yeah, maybe yeah. Amazon. So I got that completely wrong. Yeah. So, me, too, me too, for the record. Yeah. And so, look, I'm going to be wrong about a lot of things. I've been humbled by life. I've been humbled by the markets. I don't want to speak in absolutes. And so I do like Bitcoin, but I do want to also take a portfolio approach to a lot of these different currencies and try to own them. But I don't want to own all of them. And I only want to own the ones that I think are going to have the longevity of the long-term use cases and the increase in the use cases. 
And to put you on the spot a little bit, and you can just give me a range, or is there a range of where you think like the equivalent of the million dollar Bitcoin of where Ethereum could go? Because me and my friends have this conversation all the time. My my thought is, or it used to be before this last little crash that we had, that if if Bitcoin is at a hundred thousand, then Ethereum will be around twenty thousand. Yeah. That, you know that that there's that ratio to it. Yeah, I don't I don't see why that wouldn't be the case. Having said that, you know, I don't know. You know, you could tell me that uh, there's uh, Fortune 50 companies. I think they're going to choose Algorand. They end up choosing Ethereum, right? And all of a sudden, Ethereum is edging up closer and closer to the market cap of Bitcoin. You know, some people think that Ethereum can flip Bitcoin. I don't see that, mm. but I don't see maybe that that's possible. And I would rather own both. You know, this way, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong in the margin. I'm not wrong by being binary, meaning zero. I own no Bitcoin or Ethereum. I'd rather choose choice, own both, as opposed to, you know, because I don't know. I'm not clever enough to know the answer. And I will say this as an investor. I think three things really hurt an investor. Number one, thinking they know more than they do. Mm -hmm. So they're operating at a level of overconfidence. And it's not the things that you think are going to go wrong that hurt you. It's the things that you think you know with absolute certainty that you actually have no idea about. That Those are the ones that hurt you. Second thing I would tell you is that you're only getting a glimmer of a certain portion of the planet. You know, it's a combination of where you grew up, how you were raised, how you were educated. Now, maybe you know a lot about how the Politburo works in Russia or the East Af African agriculture and commercial system. I don't. Yeah, I haven't I spent enough time there. I haven't had enough information related to it. And you can't learn about those places by reading in a book. You actually have to be there. Uh, and so just imagine all the things that we don't know. And yet we're making these investment calculations. So you always have to be careful. You have to be humbled by that. And then the third thing I would say is uh, you got to be psychologically ready mm. to be wrong. And you got to be psychologically ready to be wrong temporarily and patient. Mm. Because I can tell you so many people get knocked out of the game. And for me, I would like to be a self-described resilient and patient person. You know, when they kicked my ass in the white house, Mark, I got my ass kicked. I got lit up by the late night comedians. It's almost five years ago now. No problem. I dusted myself off, went back to work. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I, and I tell people, I don't wake up in the morning and, and kick myself in the pants. Say, well, I made a mistake in the white house five years ago and got fired. I don't lament it. I said, that happened. Let's move on. Yeah. And you have to do that as an investor as well. You know, I don't sit here laboring over my miss of Bitcoin at 400 or my miss of Uber. And I, and I would recommend other people don't do that. Focus on today. Focus on the present. Price yourself into the market today. Then make the decisions to the best of your capability. Yeah, that's really good advice. And, that, and that's it. That's, and that's all we really can do. Yeah, that's really good advice. One one thing um, that that I wanted to touch on, and and we're we're closing in at the end of our time here. You've been so generous with your with your thoughts and your and your brilliance, and I thank you for that. Um, the the other kind of big trend that I've been hopping on with crypto recently, aside from the NFT stuff related to NFTs, is this is this one project called Looks Rare. I don't know if you've heard of this project, no. uh, but it, it's basically a competitor to OpenSea. And they did what's known as like a vampire attack where they uh, airdrop a bunch of tokens to, to people that they have access to the wallets. And then you're allowed to stake those tokens at incredibly high um, APRs and people are making like 15, you know, hundred percent on these tokens over like a two week period. And then they rug pull and it's a friggin' disaster. What, what are your thoughts on some of these kind of, if people tell you, hey, I've been hearing about these liquidity pools where I can stake my tokens and I'm getting much better interest rates. And what what's your kind of take on that whole staking uh, universe in crypto? OK, but 
you know, again, all the coins are different. So I, let me just talk about the ones I know. Like if you're sure. staking Algorand as an example, why are you staking Algorand? Well, Algorand wants to incentivize you to be a long-term holder of Algorand. And so you're going to stake it. You're going to lock it up for a period of years or whatever it might be yep. to get the dividends or the additional algos. And, you know, to me, I can't really describe the other staking protocols or what the, what the things are, but if it's similar to Algorand, what I would say is there's value in the staking because now the whole community knows there's an installed base. And so it's easier to traffic. It's easier to set value. Mm. Uh, you get less volatility in the asset prices. It's better for transactional activity. You know, volatility is not great. If you're calling something digital gold and it's moving like a really bad cardiac rhythm, <laughs> then you know, you know, you're in the wrong you're in the wrong genre, you have the wrong definition. And so the staking sure. helps to smooth all of that out. And if the foundation associated with the coins or the corporation or the there's a body of coins left over, like there is in Bitcoin that have to be mined that reward people to keep the stuff. I think it's a I think it's very healthy. I think it's a very it's a brilliant right. thing. And here's the thing I would say broadly about cryptocurrency and the blockchain. What a libertarian concept and what a concept that's been engineered mm. to be motivated to reward people. Uh, and, you know, as a human being, even though you look like a very attractive monkey right now when I'm speaking to you, but <laughs> as a human being, you know, if you're getting well rewarded, it will incentivize your behavior. Yeah, no, that's good. And look, and to wrap up, um, are you a Sopranos fan by any chance? Of course. So, you know, um, when, when I was growing up, I uh, in season two of The Sopranos, there was this one line where one of the guys says, look, whatever Tony needs, if he needs web work, if he needs whatever. And I remember me and my friends always loved that episode so much at the time because The Sopranos were on the the idea of the web as the web was like starting to be born. Do you think if The Sopranos were on today that Tony would be bitching about masks or, or telling Janice, how can you walk in there without wearing your mask or... You know, like, uh, anyway, this is a senseless question, but for some reason I've always like, like in my mind, they came out a lot better when I was going to talk to you about the Sopranos, but, uh, well, listen, I mean, you know, I watched the Sopranos. I grew up in a neighborhood. There was a lot of rough people in my neighborhood. Um, you, you know, my dad was more like the bus driver that De Niro played in the Bronx tale. He was no funny. Oh, what a movie. Dad. Yeah. My dad yeah. was the type of guy where if you got the parking ticket on main street, I was eight years old. He made us walk up to the post office, get a money order, pay the parking ticket. Wow. He didn't even go home and write a check. You know, he was that kind of guy. And so there were no funny business with him, but I grew up in a tough neighborhood. So I had, I've had, had my ass kicked and I had <laughs> kicked some ass. Um, but I think, you know, I would like to think of Tony as a smart guy. You know, yeah. he wasn't well-educated. If you watch the princes of Newark, which I loved, by the way, for the yeah, record. Great I movie. I love the movie. Yeah, I thought you it was know, Let's just go over his origin. He wasn't a smart guy, but he had a lot of common sense. Right. Um, and you're trying to measure and intersect that common sense with your toughness because you're a leader of a mob. Um, my guess, he would have been some somewhat hypocritical about the masks. Right. But I think he would have been concerned about his health enough to have gotten himself vaccinated. Right. Because right. I think it's just, it's just the science behind it is in, right. unequivocal. For Just me, the remember fact that I'm I'm a person that's read without going into detail. I have read a lot of our intelligence briefings sure, as a result sure. of my governmental experience, and I understand the adversaries and what we're up against. And it's unfortunate, but a lot of Americans don't understand it. But they're being manipulated and co-opted by Russian intelligence services, Chinese intelligence services, making them believe disinformation. Sure. Um, and they also recognize there's a liberty streak in Americans. And so they perverted this concept that, well, if you don't get the vaccine, you're proving your liberty and someone told you to get it. And this is your way of exercising your own self-control. And then when they shut their computers off at night in Moscow, they giggle that they were able to convince a large portion of the population not to get the vaccine. So I would like to think Tony was smart enough to do that. 
I'm sure if he was at the Bada Bing Club, there's no effing way he's wearing a mask. Okay. So, and, and by the way, you see that with our political leaders, right? They're telling you to put the mask on, but they're at the Super Bowl without a mask. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, to you me, I sort of feel like this thing has now been played out. Uh, I'm hoping they lift these mask mandates at this point. I agree. Um, and I'm hoping that we can go on to as much normalcy as we can. Um, and, uh, but listen, you know, I've got a lot of work done over Zoom. I've got a lot of work done from my home, more than I ever thought possible. Me too. As a result of the pandemic. And so there's pluses and minuses. But of course, it's an unspeakable tragedy that this many people had to lose their lives. I didn't think that was necessary, frankly. Yeah, yeah, same. And I, um, I, you know, you, I, I have to apologize. I had to do this call at 3.30. Oh, oh, no, no worries. No worries at but, all. Anthony. You're uh, you're a very kind man but, and a very smart man, and I really but, appreciate your time. But, but let's ahead. stay in touch, all right, my brother. I I enjoyed this, all right. All right, Anthony. I want to see you in the real world without your your your, your cigarette, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do a follow up, and I'll you know I'll show you my actual face. It's just a all face right. of a Cuban. Cuban, my. I idea. appreciate that, my friend. It's great to spend time with you. God bless. Best of luck with Club Metaverse. All right, thank you so much, Anthony. You be Bye. well, my brother.